So the big question that I want to start off with is why would we be concerned about uh, a topic like uh, spiritual pathways? And I want to try and put that into a bit of a context. One of the things that I think we all believe in uh, is the idea that God offers to each one of us a very personal relationship. Um, God doesn't just give us a set of principles and uh, expect us to kind of, uh, you know, live out these principles. Uh, he's not sort of the impersonal force um, of something like Star Wars. We believe in a God who's very, very personal. And yet, when we live that out, I wonder sometimes if we maybe have been influenced by many other um, religions in which their relationship to the deity is not exactly um, very personal. And I just want to put this into a bit of a context. Isn't it true when you think back maybe in your own life about the relationships that you have that have gone uh, the deepest? <clears throat> that it's not just the fact that you say that you have a close relationship, but that there's a great deal of communication. And often the closest relationships are those relationships where uh, there's been a connection and maybe we haven't thought about how all of that happens. But one of the things that has been happening in a lot of the research is that there are certain what we might call intelligences that uh, when you start to communicate with somebody at those kinds of levels, there's a deep sort of connection and an intimacy that is developed. And, and let me give you an illustration. When we think of Moses, who was in the desert, um, after about 40 years um, tending some sheep, one day he sees a burning bush. And that may not be remarkable unless you maybe have lived in the desert or in a very flat sort of plain where there's almost nothing to, to look at. And uh, you see this bush burning, but it doesn't burn up. And I think that this has a great deal of meaning uh, to Moses. Uh, when you think about Moses, he grew up in a society that uh, in Egypt where symbols uh, were very, very prominent. And he understood a great deal about symbolism. And I imagine that when he first saw this bush that's burning, uh, some of the thoughts that might have come to his mind were things like, well, out here in the desert, that's a flash in the pan. Whatever's on fire, this bush, it'll burn up, it'll be gone, and I'm not really going to pay a whole lot of attention. And he may have thought deeply or had some sort of emotional response, and that maybe feels a great deal like my life. It's been a flash in the pan, and I tried to, you know, help God out. I, I tried to help my people. And uh, I've been disappointed. I got uh, to the place where I had to run out here to the edge of the desert. And he may have, in looking at that burning bush at the beginning, thought, this is kind of like a symbol of my life. And yet what begins to happen is that He's attracted to it because it keeps burning and keeps burning. It is not a flash in the pan. And we don't know all of what went through Moses' mind, but at some point he begins to recognize that something else is going on. And he begins to equate that to the presence of God. And uh, I would suggest that if we start to look at this through the eyes of the sacred pathways, what better way for God to have communicated with Moses 
then something that he would see in a place of solitude, something that uh, had a traditional uh, symbolic meaning. You know, if God had sent a messenger uh, with a message, I doubt it would have had as deep a meaning because he probably would have experienced this sort of thing a great deal before. And he would have probably thought, this is probably a trick. It probably won't amount to a whole lot. Um, he had had living in Pharaoh's house, all sorts of uh, messages that would have come, you know, and our sort of situation might be like getting a text or an email. And we have all sorts of spam emails uh, that we might um, have not paid any attention to. And, and luckily that would have been what his response would have been. But God chose something that would communicate at a very, very deep level uh, what Gary Thomas has uh, coined a sacred pathway. And it has gotten his attention and that ensued a very significant conversation about all sorts of things uh, such as was God for him, uh, God calling him, his uh, relationship with God, him understanding that uh, God really approved of him and uh, had some work for him to do and wanted to fulfill maybe some of his wildest and deepest dreams. And I'd suggest to you that God being the God that he is, doesn't just communicate in only one way. Uh, he knows us deeply and he tends to find ways to communicate uh, in the most meaningful way possible. Uh, another example that I wanted to bring up is Peter. Um, after he has uh, denied Christ and he's really not thinking that he is worthy uh, at all to come back to be part of uh, the 12 disciples. Uh, he probably thinks that going back to be a fisherman is really the best hope that he has. I've reflected on how Jesus chose to communicate with him. He didn't go and find him. He didn't knock on his door. He didn't uh, write him a letter. Uh, what he does is he knows that Peter's going to be out fishing. And we don't know all of the uh, details about that. But after Peter has been out fishing and is coming in to shore, Jesus is sitting on the shore waiting for Peter which I think would have communicated, Peter, I know you, and I know what you're going to be up to. But I think as you reflect on it, uh, any of you that have worked night shifts, uh, one of the things you probably realize is that you often end up being incredibly hungry uh, because you're on a different schedule, and he had been working hard all night. And the first thing that Jesus gives uh, as a present, in a sense, or the way that he communicates with uh, Peter is, come and have breakfast. And I don't think there's anything that would have communicated to Peter, I'm accepting you. I know you. I know the language of what really matters to you the most. You're a sensate. You're someone who uh, feels at a very deep level all the things that <clears throat> are going on in this world. Uh, you've been out fishing, you've been cold, uh, you're tired, and a good meal uh, over a fire, one that an experience that you've had many, many, many times, is going to communicate to you that I care about what's going on. But it doesn't just stop there. Uh, as Peter's eating his meal, <clears throat> um, he's with many of his best friends, other fishermen, and he's part of that camaraderie. 
And uh, I think they probably had lots of conversation that was flowing. And he probably begins to feel a little bit like, oh, some of the old uh, feelings of some of the old dreams are being resurrected a little bit. And Jesus wants to have a conversation with Peter. And what he does, I think, is incredibly meaningful. He pulls Peter aside, and he and Peter go for a walk. And, and why I think this is so important is that this is going to be a very painful conversation. But Jesus doesn't do this in a public way, even though Peter's denial was well known. And he certainly would, be a, would have been justified in doing that. But in a way in which all the other disciples know, so there's a certain level of uh, being out in the open. Everybody knows that Jesus is having this conversation, but they don't get to hear and know the details unless Peter shares those details with them, which I think obviously he did at a later point in time. But what is communicated to the disciples is that Jesus is going to have this conversation uh, and Jesus accepts Peter and it's a, uh, a very strong vote of confidence and whatever they talked about really is none of their business other than that they needed to know that Jesus had accepted Peter back at a very, very deep level. Now, we get to read the details of the conversation, and I'm sure you've heard many, many sermons about that. But it seems to me that uh, Jesus not only um, gives us content, but he does it in such a way that it becomes incredibly meaningful for us. Now, Tyler had mentioned that uh, I live... Uh, out on a farm. And uh, a number of years ago, when I had moved there, we had this 80 acres, and I was thinking, well, we probably ought to do something with it. And uh, there was a gentleman in our church that I was chatting with, and uh, I asked him, because he raised goats. Um, I grew up in Nigeria, my parents were missionaries, and I was familiar with uh, goats uh, to some degree. And uh, he was a sheep and goat farmer, so I asked him if he would mentor me uh, in the art of uh, uh, raising uh, these kinds of animals, and, and he agreed to uh, do that, and it's a very long story, but um, at one point in time, um, as he and I were working together, uh, he was telling me that he needed to uh, do some butchering, and he just sort of wondered out loud whether I would be interested in helping him out uh, in that chore. And I said to him, well, sure. Uh, when are you going to do that? And he said, uh, well, tomorrow night, uh, if you could come over for three or four hours, I've got uh, about a dozen rabbits. And if you could help me with that, I would appreciate it. And uh, what he said next was, are you sure? that you don't mind doing this? I said, I'd love to. And uh, he expressed about seven or eight times uh, how meaningful that was to him. And what I've realized since then is that uh, if you want to you know, win a farmer's heart, uh, you participate in some of the things that they maybe least enjoy. Uh, a lot of farmers, uh, will send their animals away um, to be butchered. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to be using those, you know, the meat for your own um, purposes, for your own table, well, it doesn't make sense financially to spend all of that money in that way. And there was a bond that developed uh, between my friend uh, as he and I butchered together. And he said often to me, you don't know how much it means to have someone who will uh, come alongside and be involved in those sorts of things. And, you know, one day his wife said to me, uh, you don't know how much uh, that particular action, you know, you going and, and spending the time uh, butchering. He now has a friend who 
uh, doesn't mind butchering uh, with him. And while that may not have a whole lot of meaning for you, uh, unless you've lived on a farm that probably, um, you know, can communicate a great deal um, if you understand that language. And uh, that's, I think, what this whole thing of um, spiritual pathways is all about, is finding those uh, sorts of connections that mean the most to you. Uh, as I've reflected in the last uh, few um, weeks as I've prepared for this, uh, I've thought about some of the times when God has spoken most deeply and impactfully uh, into my life. And uh, I'll just tell you and share with you uh, two or three stories. Uh, I remember um, we were, my wife and I and family lived in Northern Ontario and we were looking at uh, a possible change, uh, moving to another um, situation. And uh, I had been asked to go to a job interview and uh, it was here in Edmonton uh, at a large church. And uh, as I was on the uh, airplane. I was praying. Uh, it was about a four-hour flight. I was praying quite a lot about, you know, what God's design and his desire was for me, uh, trying to discern his will. And uh, this was back in the days when <clears throat> uh, airplanes would have a movie uh, that they only had one movie, and it was showing up on a screen. And, uh, you know, uh, you basically watch the movie you could pay for uh you know getting the headphones so that you could hear the uh audio and uh so i was watching this movie and uh, it was a movie that spoke deeply into my life it was uh the story that uh, in many ways uh, felt very very parallel to what i was going through it was about uh, several young um, high school boys who were in a town that was dying. It was a coal town. I came from Sault Ste. Marie. It was a steel town. It was dying. And uh, they were trying to find a way out. Um, and they entered a, a project into a science fair and uh, had been given the opportunity uh, during that whole situation uh, for some scholarships to go away um, to university. I think the name of the movie was October Sky. And as I was watching that, um, I remember thinking, um, could this be God speaking to me? Is he giving me the affirmation that just as these boys were getting a ticket out, that God was in a way giving a ticket out for me and our family from a situation that really, really did not look very promising at all. And one of the things that I remember saying to God was, well, this probably is not you because I'm not reading my Bible at the moment and I'm not finding you um, through, you know, the sacred writ, or this isn't a moment of prayer in which I'm discerning you speaking to me. But what I've begun to understand is that um, God has most often in the moments when I need his guidance the most, he's often spoken to me through uh, the arts. And there's something about the arts that has occupied a very deep place in my life. Um, and God seems to enjoy them as much, if not more, than I do. And he very often will speak uh, to me uh, and show up in ways that, you know, surprise me. Now, I believe deeply in uh, the authority of Scripture and that that's uh, how God, you know, gives us his truth and speaks to us. Uh, I remember earlier in my life, um, as our children were growing up, uh, I had been away, and my wife was telling me that uh, she had been 
spending some time with uh, our two boys who were grade two and grade six or something like that, um, grade four, I guess. And uh, they had had a conversation one evening um, that was a pretty deep conversation. Um, it was uh, sparked off by uh, talking about uh, the story of the Lion King. And uh, the end of their conversation ended up talking about uh, the big questions of life. And uh, the end result of that conversation was that both boys had prayed with my wife to receive Jesus into their heart. And as she told me that, um, I remember having a conversation with God later thinking, you use the Lion King uh, to bring my boys to a, a moment where they would see you in a way that, you know, prompted them to uh, give their lives to Christ. Um, I would have expected that you would have used, uh, you know, a sermon or a Bible or, uh, you know, something a little more sacred. And there's become this sort of um, thing between God and I that he often reminds me, I can use anything I want. Uh, I can even have a donkey talk to people if that's, you know, that comes from a scriptural story with Balaam. Uh, I can do talk to people any way that I want. But I like to use the ways that really are meaningful uh, and develop a, a deep level of connection. I, I remember one other story. Um, my, when we had moved out here, we got a phone call one evening that my dad was not in very good shape. He had been in hospital and the doctors suggested that uh, all family should come um, as soon as they could. I uh, got the first flight that I could. It was a, a red eye special. And uh, uh, I phoned one of my friends because uh, it ended up, uh, these are the days when uh, WestJet uh, didn't fly to Toronto. So it was uh, Hamilton and uh, he lived nearby. Uh, and I, ended up getting there at about uh, one o'clock in the morning. Well, of course there were no uh, rental car agencies uh, open at that point. And as he picked me up, um, I had asked him if I could borrow um, a vehicle. Um, and so, uh, so that I could drive to Sault Ste. Marie, which was uh, an eight hour drive. And as we were leaving the airport, um, he turned north instead of south. And I said, well, where are you going? He says, well, we're going to Sault Ste. Marie. I said, well, uh, that's a long drive. And he said, yes, that's exactly the point. I know you're tired. I know that you're emotionally spent. And you need somebody with you for this drive. And I don't want you to uh, end up being a... Um, traffic fatality and I've taken the next three days off work and I'm going with you because I know it's really really important for you to spend these last days with your dad and I want to be with you and that spoke uh, a deep language in my heart um, things that matter the most to me and I could take a look at the various pathways but I began to recognize that I can begin to expect or look for God uh, to show up, to speak um, at different times in my life by using languages that mean a great deal to me. Um, friendship has always meant a lot. Solitude has meant a lot. And so one of the questions as you break off into your groups, I want you to uh, maybe chat about or when are the times when God has spoken uh, most meaningfully uh, in your life? And is there a connection uh, between those ways in which God has spoken to you uh, and one of the pathways you've taken the assessment and, and see if you notice any uh, connections that way. And uh, then the, you know, sort of follow up to that would just simply be um, does this open up possibilities for you? Uh, 
I remember one lady, uh, as she went through this material, she began to recognize that God most often has talked with her and uh, connected with her when she's been in nature. And uh, what she began to do is she kind of made the connection and she made it a practice to go up to either Banff or um, Jasper um, three times a year uh, because she said that uh, what that would do for her is it would uh, open up uh, ways for God to speak to her. It would energize her uh, relationship with God because when she would go on this uh, weekend to uh, Jasper or whatever, um, God often ended up speaking to her in ways that she heard him that she would never hear when she was in the city. And uh, it just encouraged her at a deep, deep level. And uh, so I'd like to encourage you to maybe explore those um, questions. And I, I think Tyler has uh, uh, put those questions uh, in one form or another uh, in a way for you. I'm going to use some of the slides from uh, a presentation that I've done. And what I want to try to do is walk through a lot more of the details rather than the big picture. And uh, basic idea here is that uh, it's worth uh, understanding each pathway uh, because while you may find three or four or two or one that are your strongest ones, uh, I think one could argue that God created every pathway. And uh, there's a verse in uh, 1 Timothy, I believe, 5, in which it talks about that all things created by God are good and are to be accepted. And it is helpful sometimes to uh, learn about other <clears throat> pathways uh, because it may enhance your communication with God. Um, but secondly, it can help you to understand other people uh, who get excited about certain uh, times that they have with God that leave you just shaking your head, wondering what do they see in that particular practice or in... Uh, you know, approaching God in that way. Uh, I remember as a college kid having a roommate who had grown up in a Presbyterian church. And uh, so I went to his church uh, with him. He came to, to my church and he loved our church. Uh, I loved his church. And a lot of it had to do with um, he was so tired of liturgy that he really appreciated the sort of free style in, in the church that I attended. And uh, I was so tired of the predictability of the so-called, um, you know, there was an unwritten liturgy actually in, in a lot of the churches that call themselves free. Uh, but I love the way that it was organized uh, in, in that Presbyterian church. And uh, sometimes we can open up new um, ways by uh, understanding others, but other times we can have a prejudice against people because we really don't understand uh, some of the ways in which uh, God has made us. And uh, there's been a lot of work uh, been done uh, in the neuroscience ways. And uh, it's interesting to me, I won't go into any detail, but uh, there's one researcher that has come up with nine different intelligences. And, and it's amazing to me how close they uh, parallel. For instance, there's uh, something called a solitude uh, intelligence. Uh, it's interesting, you take some folks and you put them, uh, in a place of solitude, and they feel energized, and they feel wonderful. Uh, and that's because they have had that area of their brain uh, developed, and, uh, you know, it has become something that is familiar and uh, brings them energy. Whereas you can take another person, put them in a place of solitude, and they um, might feel either nothing or they might even feel fear. And uh, the research goes on to say that uh, 
all of these intelligences can be awakened. Uh, some of them can be frozen because of trauma. And uh, there are ways in which you can overcome some of that. But to experience God in all parts of your personality, uh, I think, is the place where we would want to go. So, Tyler, if you could uh, uh, maybe move to maybe the screen. Uh, so move further on to the naturalist um, slide. Yeah, so those of you that maybe scored high in this area of uh, the natural uh, speaks to you. Um, I want to talk about uh, just defining that a little bit further. Uh, some of these pictures on this slide, uh, my wife and I were up in Alaska and we went on a, a little uh, excursion around Mount McKinley. And what was fascinating to me was that uh, all of the people that were on this in this little plane, uh, none of the others, as far as I know, were people that uh, were Christians. But the level of worship, uh, the level of awe uh, that we all experienced um, was just amazing. And we landed on a glacier and we spent about an hour there um, and nobody wanted to get back into the plane. The pilot almost had to uh, physically push us back into the plane. Uh, there was something incredibly appealing about being in that uh, place of purity. And um, it was just an amazing time. And I know that uh, I made a few comments about, uh, isn't it amazing how, uh, you know, we could experience God in this situation and nobody argued. In fact, there's lots of nodding heads. Uh, there's only about six other people with us, but um, those of us who are naturalists, uh, it's something that just is hard to explain, but there's times of connection that you have with God that just open up. Now, my brother, uh, he's a, a computer analyst, and uh, one of the stories that I recall is uh, when we visited the Grand Canyon as kids, uh, he looked out. Uh, over the gorge and uh, took a look and came back to the car and said big hole in the ground can we move on can we go somewhere else <laughs> and uh, he wasn't uh, captured by the awe uh, of what was going on and uh, I think one of the things that is important here is to uh, realize that you know, when you get excited about something, it doesn't mean that everyone else necessarily will. Uh, now, don't let that take anything away from your time with God. Um, but understand that uh, that area, uh, that pathway may not mean as much um, to someone else. Now, one of the dangers is that you could begin to worship the creation uh, and really not actually hear anything from God. Uh, you see, and we just had our relationship with God, uh, that would still be better than losing God and uh, trying everything you, you know, spending all of your time trying to uh, save creation or... Uh, you know, keep it pure, or worshiping some element of um, of nature. So that's one of the dangers. Uh, I think another danger is just the danger of uh, you know looking down on people who maybe don't appreciate uh, nature as much as as you do. Um, the next sort of category is. Uh, I believe it's the one about uh, tradition or, okay, a sensate. So the idea about a sensate is that you will um, appreciate uh, the various senses that you have uh, and those experiences that uh, bring about, you know, the touch and the feel, all of those sorts of things. 
uh, lead you towards God uh, rather than distracting you uh, from your uh, relationship with God. And uh, I think one of the things about that is that uh, sometimes there are some theological uh, um, sort of um, traditions that really negate or look down on the senses as if they are uh, evil in, in one way or another. Uh, so someone like Oswald Chambers, uh, who certainly is not a new age thinker, um, but one of the things that he says is, our spiritual life does not grow in spite of the body, um, but uh, our senses are, are really important. Uh, he then quotes, of the earth, earthy is man's glory. And so the idea here is that um, God created our bodies, he created our senses, and uh, often our senses uh, experiencing God in those situations um, may be one of the uh, most important times uh, or that place of connection. Uh, and that's a really, really wide arena. Uh, you know, there are times when a really great meal uh, has bonded me deeply with the people that I had the meal with, but it was also a time where God was part of that experience. Uh, the danger is that some sensates uh, really begin to go down a road of uh, addiction where uh, the sense itself becomes way more important than it being something that leads us to God. But what we understand in the whole area of relationships is that when you are with somebody experiencing something at a deep sensual level, there's a bonding that goes on. You go to a, an excellent concert with someone else that understands that uh, kind of music you're bonded together, you know, as you have a conversation about that music later on. Uh, aromas can be very, very important. And so, um, you know, uh, paying attention to that may be something that uh, enhances your time with God. And so I would just encourage you to explore um, in this area. Uh, if it leads you down the road of uh, being distracted or down the road of uh, possibly um, some kind of addiction, well, then you need to uh, refocus things so that you uh, don't get that distraction. But very often you can learn to let your senses lead you to God rather than away from God. Um, I realized at a time not so long ago that, uh, well, this hasn't been important uh, often. I realized that uh, God very often has spoken to me using the senses. Uh, and I began to recognize that that may be an area of growth um, and begin to open myself up to experiencing. Uh, I've been someone who's read a lot of books and, uh, uh, use my mind, but to begin to understand that the senses may be very important as well has been something that I've begun to appreciate. Uh, so another pathway that uh, we maybe could take a look at is uh, that of, uh, I think the next one, if I remember right, uh, the traditionalist. And uh, for some of us, uh, being connected to others, maybe from another time period or through rituals, uh, through symbols, uh, can be something that speaks to us in very, very deep, deep ways. For others, uh, we don't really understand those symbols at all. Uh, I think of um, uh, Moses and uh, Egypt was soaked in all sorts of uh, uh, symbols and uh, rituals and it seems to me that God used Moses to develop, if you will, the uh, 
rituals and the um, worship of the new nation Israel. And uh, so much of the way that God uh, showed up, you know, through having Moses give them the Ten Commandments, um, there was also the destruction, I think, of uh, their uh, idolism, you know, their way of uh, worshiping idols uh, through many of the experiences in the desert. And uh, when you think of, of Moses, uh, you know, he uh, seems to connect with God through symbols and rituals. And you take someone like, uh, say, the Apostle John, uh, you don't hardly ever see that uh, aspect in his life at all. Uh, I have a friend who can hardly think of anything more wonderful than to spend an afternoon uh, in a really old cathedral. Um, the architecture speaks to him uh, and it often leads him particularly in that context because he understands uh, the architecture and what was trying to be achieved uh, by those who built and uh, developed the architecture. And uh, if that's something that speaks to you, um, I encourage you to find ways to let that um, be a, a pathway to God. Others of us, uh, you know, we value our freedom, but don't let that be a way of looking down your nose at others. Um, you know, saying, well, I'm free. Uh, try to understand someone who loves the traditions. But one of the dangers is that the tradition is not the important thing. Uh, it's only, again, a pathway to actually uh, connecting with God. It's about the meaning behind uh, all of these symbols. And, uh, you know, that all can be very, very beautiful. But uh, the real point of it is that time when you connect with God in a very, very deep way. So um, our next uh, category. Um, an ascetic. So <clears throat> uh, an ascetic is, uh, and we want to try to differentiate this between someone, uh, one of the other categories. This is someone who loves God primarily through simplicity. Uh, they're not someone who just hates the senses. It's just that they find many of the senses uh, are a distraction. And so very often, uh, one of the things that becomes important is that they love times of solitude and times of simplicity. Uh, the story is told of St. Francis of Assisi that when he, uh, at the beginning of his uh, uh, growth in Christ, uh, it was very, very uh, meaningful for him to give away everything that he owned and in that way, he uh, felt closer to Christ, but he was still living at home. And so he was giving away a lot of things that his father owned without his father's uh, permission. And, uh, you know, again, there's something there that we need to, one that uh, someone else, uh, you know, uh, really appreciates. And, and so, uh, don't try to put the burden on everyone else to become an ascetic like yourself, but appreciate the fact that uh, you find that very helpful. Uh, I've often taken times of uh, retreat, uh, times where I will um, uh, go away to a hermitage for three or four days, and that's been very, very meaningful for me, but I also understand that uh, that's not for everyone. Uh, that might actually uh, cause a few people that I know to come unglued. And uh, so I don't sort of put that on everyone else. And uh, I think the important thing here is uh, the danger for an ascetic is uh, that they kind of get on a campaign to, you know, make everyone else uh, just like them. And, uh, that's not the point. The point is uh, learning to love God, learning to love other people. And if what you're doing is alienating other people, uh, 
something has gone wrong. You aren't doing, um, you're not using one of the pathways uh, in the best possible way. So um, let's move on to the next one. A caregiver. Um, now, it's very important here to differentiate between a person who is, uh, shall we say, addicted to pleasing other people. Uh, this person could never say no to someone who has a need because they've been uh, told or they've been trained uh, to always be in service and never to take care of themselves. Uh, that is not what we mean. Uh, and if we were to use some kind of symbol, uh, sometimes uh, there are people who are always serving, but you only ever have sort of a connection with them through their hands and you never get to know who they are. A caregiver, someone who experiences God through the care that they give to others uh, is quite different. Um, this is the person who actually gets closer to God through the care that they give to other people. Um, just as an example of that, uh, Mother Teresa, for instance, uh, I think would be one that, uh, you know, would be in this category. As she cared for those who were uh, on the margins, uh, she was giving to them, but part of her motivation was that she would see the face of God as she would care for them. And uh, the caregivers are those who, in their care for others, there is something that they see about God. There is something that they experience with God that they would never experience while they're in solitude. And uh, many of us, I think, uh, may have more of a caregiving gift than we might uh, imagine ourselves. Uh, we might not think of ourselves as a caregiver, and yet we may be giving care to others in just ways that, you know, we discount. Um, but the, the danger for a caregiver is that they can worship, you know, the giving of care rather than let that be a time when they hear the voice of God uh, in a very uh, specific way. Um, and so I, I just encourage you, if you're someone who has often heard God in solitude, um, value the people who often are in a place where they are giving uh, to others and recognize that they hear God speaking to the group and that that's just as personal as the times when you are hearing God all by yourself. Um, I remember uh, being in a period of time where I didn't do any spiritual direction uh, during one summer and I never thought of myself really as, as a a caregiver, but as I started giving spiritual direction again in September, uh, something came alive in me. And as I began to think about it and understand it, I realized that caregiving was far more uh, a pathway that God had used and that I needed in my life than I had ever imagined. And so, uh, you know, I began to value uh, the communal sense of hearing God uh, with others uh, more than I had often done before. So then our next category, um, I want to get the order right here so that I don't have um, uh, Tyler having to search for it. Um, a contemplative is not the same as an ascetic. Uh, a contemplative is just someone who loves to hang out with God. Um, someone who's deeply in love with someone else. Uh, let's think about uh, romantic love. Uh, all they care about is hanging out with that person. And uh, they don't really care in some ways whether they're with other people 
or whether they are, uh, you know, whether there's other people around or whether they're there one by one or one on one. And uh, I think that uh, uh, don't confuse, uh, you know, that whole time of uh, solitude. There are many contemplatives that uh, experience uh, the times of contemplation uh, in a communal setting just as much as they do in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, situation. But the thing about it is that uh, they really couldn't put words to what's happening. Uh, remember one gentleman saying that uh, for him, contemplative, uh, you know, the way he had explained it is, is kind of like when my kids go to bed, uh, sometimes I'll just look in the doorway and I'll just pay attention. I'll just gaze at them when they're sleeping. And that love that begins to spill out of my heart as I watch them sleep uh, is kind of that sort of contemplative uh, experience. And uh, whatever times bring you to that place where you have that communion with God, maybe it's during a time of uh, uh, the Lord's Supper, or it could be through a time of worship, it could be while you're in nature. Um, this spills off, you know, out into many of the other pathways, but it's a time when you were just connected with God, and there was probably no intellectual content you know, lovers uh, often say things to each other that uh, if you looked at the content, uh, you know, wasn't really a lot of intellectual stuff, you know, things like, uh, I love you, you're beautiful, you're marvelous. Um, but the emotional content of it is, is a very deep bonding uh, experience. And a contemplative is someone who uh, can spend a whole morning hanging out with God and uh, they might not be able to tell you much about the content. I remember seeing a spiritual director one time and he asked me what my relationship with God was like and I said it's been good but I, I don't know how to explain it and uh, after he listened to me for a while he said well have you ever saw, thought of yourself as a contemplative? Um, you just sort of spent time with God and it was good but you have no words to explain it. And that sense of God's presence was uh, enough. Um, that was what was feeding my heart uh, during that time. Um, now somebody who's steeped in the intellectual path might not really understand that at all, but it's, an, you know, I think a good thing to value um, all of that. And so you know, a contemplative, one of the dangers is that they can ignore uh, other aspects of life. Uh, it's good to be close to God in this way, but it's not the only pathway uh, as well. So uh, I think the next one, okay, that's the intellectual. And this has nothing to do with your intelligence. It just is that you sense God more through your mind than through other aspects of your um, body, in particular the emotions. Um, this is the person who is bored, you know, during the musical part of a church service, and for them things are starting, you know, when the sermon starts. Uh, these are the people who are, you know, love to be in a library and. Uh, you know, it's when their mind is being stimulated that uh, they are uh, feeling close to God. And uh, if that's who you are, um, you need to schedule time uh, where you can study. You, you can't just do that sort of thing in 10 minutes. Uh, you know, some of us, uh, if we don't read six or seven books a week, uh, you know, we feel like our minds are being uh, shriveled up and we're dying. And so for you to be able to um, stimulate that area, that part of your brain is, is very important. But remember that you're not worshiping reason. Um, it's about appreciating uh, 
the structures and the uh, rational uh, parts of uh, our faith and uh, always remember to let that uh, lead you back to God. There's also uh, the next category, uh, the enthusiast. And uh, this is someone who in a way is sort of more of a cheerleader. Um, these are the people who, you know, love to, um, uh, when I think of this, I think of David who danced uh, before the Lord uh, and his wife, uh, Michael, I think, uh, you know, despised that. Um, these are those who are uh, very lost in celebration and, and exuberant and very often are able to uh, get the rest of us uh, more in that direction. Uh, they're sort of a cheerleader. And uh, their enthusiasm is uh, often catching with others. Um, but those of us that don't appreciate this really ought to remember that um, uh, someone who is unhindered in their exuberance for God is not to ever be despised. We don't want to be uh, like David's wife, uh, Michael, who really at that point uh, exits the uh, stage of scripture um, because she wrote off others. And I personally uh, really have had to work on this area. Uh, I remember once uh, I was on staff at Beulah and uh, one of my uh, areas of um, needing to grow, I was asked to give announcements uh, one day. And uh, I, I'm usually a very sort of calm, um, very more of a, a rational person. But uh, as I gave that announcement, I. Uh, actually jumped up and down on stage as a way of growing in uh, the congregation, uh, just sort of um, had a, a moment of, of hilarity because it was not, uh, you know, something I was very used to. But as I gave my uh, announcement of, of an event that was coming up, I, I was trying to grow in that area. Well, it became one of the um, you know, a very well attended event, uh, simply because I was experimenting with uh, learning to be a lot more of an enthusiast. And rather than look down on these things, it becomes important for us to be able to uh, appreciate um, and grow in, in, in those, you know, in areas that you're not uh, um, strong in. If you are an enthusiast, just don't ever look down on that. Um, it is not something that, uh, you know, maybe your tradition isn't excited that way, but uh, uh, you often have a very important role in encouraging other people to um, experience God in an emotional uh, way. And then uh, another uh, pathway is uh, one that's, I think, often very uh, un you know misunderstood. And these are those who are uh, involved in uh, combating evil. Uh, they are people who <clears throat> are not just mad at the world and uh, want an opportunity to uh, reach out and, and confront. These are people who experience God most as they are fighting evil. When Jesus cleansed the temple, uh, he did that out of a pure kind of uh, righteous anger. And uh, confronting evil is something that probably few of us uh, have the gift of doing. Most of us are fearful, fearful when we confront evil. But uh, it might be an area where we need to learn how to uh, trust God and, and confront evil uh, out of the right reasons. Uh, and I've talked with a number of people who are learning uh, something about themselves and have joined uh, some form of uh, fighting, you know, against social injustice. And uh, it is a little more popular now with the whole uh, social justice movement. But what we need to remember, uh, the danger is that we can allow um, 
the social justice to become more important than uh, representing the God who cares about justice. Um, it isn't always, you know, there are times when God has not, uh, for instance, the issue of slavery. Um, there are times in history where God was not moving uh, in a very visible form. Uh, and Jesus addressed this, you know, that uh, there are times and places uh, for our confrontation of evil. Uh, and yet there were times uh, later on in life or in our history when someone like, uh, um, well, just many uh, others that were led by God to combat slavery and are still doing that today are um, very, very uh, godly people. And so we need to uh, either be growing in this area or be able to accept that. Now, it can be a very lonely uh, sort of uh, pathway, but um, we are um, called by God to confront sin. Now, I always, as I go through this, uh, get lost somewhere along the way, but we sort of walked through each of these areas and uh, I guess where I'd like to leave it is um, for us to grow in each of these areas. Uh, don't overdose on uh, trying to work on the weakest areas too much. You're going to find that uh, growing in those areas is uh, a challenge. Uh, maybe one or two times a year, um, appreciating one of the lower ones uh, might be uh, good for you. Uh, spending a great deal of your time uh, in the ones that you've scored highest uh, is probably, especially with times when you are drained, uh, it might be good for you to allow that a little bit more. Um, but um, uh, I, I would encourage you to uh, take a, a look at all of these. And, uh, you know, if you're experiencing God in each of these areas, uh, occasionally, uh, I think that's a well-rounded uh, spiritual temperament. Uh, it seems to me that many of our traditions spiritually uh, focus on one or two, um, but to appreciate all of them is probably uh, a really good sort of strategy for us to work uh, towards. So I want to open things up, but Tyler, I'm not sure... Uh, did you want to sort of have a, a, a close or do you want to just open it up for questions?